It's go time. We have four weeks left until the fantasy playoffs. You have weeks 11, 12, 13, 14, and then it's here, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I'm going to go through everything that happened today and how it should be impacting fantasy football teams going forward. Starting off with the Indianapolis Colts, the main story is Jonathan Taylor, right? Thank God I can finally admit he was my most drafted running back on underdog this year. And we are seeing why now. Jonathan Taylor, a rocket ship up if you are looking at his usage from this PFF chart. I mean, he plays 50 snaps this week in comparison to Zag Moss at nine. He has 23 carries in comparison to Zag Moss at one. I thought ultimately Zag Moss was going to be like a Tyler Algier player in this offense where you never really wanted to start him. You could if you were absolutely desperate. He was just a premium handcuff back. He's even less than that, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, you see that they gave Jonathan Taylor $42 million for a reason. The man looks like he is going to be a top three to five running back down the stretch. Now, our second, no, I believe our third most drafted wide receiver on underdog this year was Michael Pittman Jr. Continues to go out there and dominate with the target share. 12 targets out of 26 total targets in this offense. Josh Down was dealing with the knee injury. So with Downs going forward, we cannot start him until we see otherwise. Once his snap rate is back closer to say, I don't want to say 100%, but at least to like 80, 90% you can play him. Here he only played 14 snaps out of a potential 57. Now going over to the Patriots, um, nothing's changed here in this offense. Yeah, Mac Jones ended up getting benched at the end. It's not like Bailey Zappi was any better. Ramondre Stevenson's still a running back that you have to start every single week based off of volume. He has 20 carries this week. He also does see five targets out of the backfield. So you're still starting your Ramondre Stevenson and you are still benching everybody else. There's nothing to talk about. Now going over to Houston, um, CJ Stroud is freaking him. Every single week, CJ Stroud just proves that he is better than you thought he was the week before. 356 passing yards, the passing touchdown. With no Nico Collins in this offense, he goes out there and he takes down Joe Burrow. Now, Devin Singletary was the workhorse back. Devin Singletary sees 30 carries out of a potential 34. He has 150 rushing yards and the rushing touchdown. And with Singletary, he does have two targets out of the backfield, but not really involved as a receiver. Now this back-to-back -back usage where we've seen Devin Singletary is the guy. He's not splitting with Mike Boone. Now, the issue is, if we get Amy Pierce back in, is Devin Singletary still the starter? I don't know. It's probably a running back by committee. And then going over to the receivers, Noah Brown, did not give him too much credit as a play this week. We knew Tank Dell was a must-start option. Dell gets there with the receiving touchdown. He actually dominates with 14 targets in this game. But Noah Brown, 172 receiving yards, pretty much wins the game at the very end for this Houston Texans team as well. Going forward, I don't think Noah Brown is a start. I think Nico Collins will still be the guy here, but I think that you are going to have Nico Collins, Tank Dell as must-start players every single week. Dalton Schultz as a must-start tight end every week. And then Devin Singletary, a must-start running back in games where we have no Pierce. If Pierce comes back, then we're going to have to reevaluate. Going over to the Cincy side, clearly Jamar Chase was not fully healthy. Chase still gets there because he's Jamar Chase. He gets to the receiving touchdown, 124 receiving yards off of only six targets in this offense, though. You actually have Tyler Boyd dominating with the usage, 12 targets, almost 120 receiving yards for Tyler Boyd. There's not a lot to take forward. I mean, here you start Chase, you start Boyd every single week. T. Higgins is going to miss. And you start chasing Higgins whenever Higgins is back. Burrow's still a guy we're starting every single week. Mixon's still a guy that we're starting every week. Just crazy to see the amount of losses this Bengals team has. Now let's go over to Green Bay. And just when I thought that Aaron Jones was a must-start running back again, it's just when Aaron Jones goes out there and has 35 rushing yards. He splits his backfield with A.J. Dillon. I mean, if you're going to look at the snap rate, you have 38 snaps for Jones, 34 snaps for Dylan. And yeah, I mean, Aaron Jones does get there with six targets, but it's in an offense that has 40 passing attempts. So going forward, I don't necessarily know if anybody's startable here in Green Bay. I think that we have to move Aaron Jones down to being that low end RB2. Now I know what you're going to say, and we'll talk about Jaden Reed in our waiver wire video tomorrow. So just make sure you are subscribed, but ultimately it's so spread out five targets, Reed, four targets, Musgrave, four ta targets, Wicks, five targets, Dobbs, seven targets, Watson, six targets, Jones, three targets, Dylan, uh, three targets, Tucker Craft, 
So if it's this spread out, it's kind of like a watered down Kansas City Chiefs offense. Now going over to Pittsburgh, Jalen Warren and Najee Harris both get there with rushing touchdowns. You have 205 rushing yards and multiple rushing touchdowns in Pittsburgh here. Going forward, not super excited about anybody. We had Deontay as that sell eye guy. Deontay comes out one reception, 17 receiving yards. I still thought you had to start him. He was dominating with target volume. But the reason we were looking to sell these wide receivers, right, is Kenny Pickett, through his entire NFL career, said one game with more than one passing touchdown. See, I mean, I guess we have to lower Deontay down these rankings as well if this offense is going to be this bad going forward. I mean, it's been bad all year. Now, going over to the Titans side of things, I'm rooting for Will Levis. I really hope he is good. We already knew to cut Will Levis from a fantasy perspective because he wasn't running the ball, but it looks like nobody else in this offense may be viable either. Derrick Henry gets you a 24 rushing yards. I mean, that's not going to get it done. Now, Taji Spears does dominate with snaps. Taji Spears does have 38 snaps compared to Derrick Henry at 27, which we know the Titans are trailing. This is kind of what we've come to expect. DeAndre Hopkins does go down significantly. He leads the team in route runs, but he has three receptions, 27 receiving yards. Very difficult to project out a wide receiver as old as DeAndre Hopkins and assume that he's going to continue to go out there and dominate in a very bad offense. Now, he was over in Buffalo, right? I mean, if he signed there, then yes, we could start Hopkins every single week. And I'm excited for the Buffalo game tomorrow night. And one thing that I'm looking at will be that James Cook pick him on underdog fantasy. They currently have James Cook at about 78 and a half total yards, which is interesting. If Leonard Fournette actually ends up playing, I'm probably going to take the fewer than 78 and a half total yards for James Cook. And if you want to check out any of those pickums, you can find that link in the description, in the comment section. Promo good flock, 100% deposit match, plus our rest of season fantasy football rankings and tiers. But going over to the Tampa side of things, Chris Godwin was dealing with an illness. So Mike Evans just goes out there and absolutely dominates. Gets to 26 points, 143 receiving yards, and leads the team with 10 targets. Rashad White continues to be laughably inefficient. He has 51 rushing yards off of 20 carries. But Rashad White continues to be someone that you're starting every single week, regardless of matchup, because of the volume. He does go through and he has 47 rushing yards and the, I'm sorry, 47 receiving yards and the receiving touchdown at the same time. So yeah, we're still going to start Evans, Godwin, White every single week. Nothing really changes. Still not that great of an offense. Now, going over to the Niners, the Niners are back, baby. I mean, who would have known? You add in a starting left tackle, you add in Debo Samuel, and this is the team that they were earlier in this season. Now, Debo Samuel does get involved as a rusher. He has a rushing touchdown and 29 rushing yards. Kind of a vintage Debo Samuel game here. George Kittle and Brandon Ayuk still remain potential sell-eye candidates. While I understand this wasn't a real football game, right? I mean, the 49ers... Blew the doors off this Jacksonville Jaguars team. At the same time, if we are looking at the target volume here, you had four targets for George Kittle and three targets for Brandon Ayuk. Now, they were hyper efficient with these targets. They were phenomenal with, I mean, about 180 receiving yards between the two of them. But in reality, going forward, I mean, it's going to be very difficult to assume that a player having about a 10% team target share is going to be able to dominate even if they are in a great offense. Like I said, I do understand that this game was over before it really started, right? And going over to Jacksonville, people are really questioning Lawrence here. I don't necessarily know if we want to go out there and full-blown panic on Trevor Lawrence, the real-life player. But from a fantasy perspective, I do think that this drops down Trevor Lawrence to no longer being startable at all. I'd assume that Trevor Lawrence goes down to being like a mid-QB2 in fantasy. And then the running back usage, yes, if you look at the snaps for ETN, they're down. I'm not worried about it. The game is over before it started. Really, the only thing that I'd be pointing out here is Calvin Ridley has three targets. So... I don't want to say drop Calvin Ridley, but you cannot start him until you see otherwise. Now, going over to the Browns game, I was very reluctant to go through and start any player in this Browns offense because they had the second lowest implied team total of any team in the NFL this week. And they go out there and they actually give you some production. You have 107 rushing yards for Jerome Ford. Jerome Ford, you were hoping that you were going to get something as a receiver. Doesn't really happen. He only has one target. What's very frustrating is, well, he does dominate with snaps here. He's 50 snaps compared to Kareem Hunt at 28. Kareem Hunt's the guy that comes away with the rushing touchdown, right? So ultimately, 
If you're a forward, you're still kind of in a committee. You're not really being involved too, too much as a receiver. And Cremont's still stealing rushing touchdowns. Um, Amari Cooper looks great. Nine targets here in this offense. David Njoku looks great with nine targets as well. A very concentrated target tree here where we have 25 total targets for Amari, David Njoku, and Elijah Moore out of a potential 32 that were available. So start David Njoku for sure going forward. Start Amari Cooper for sure going forward. And if Elijah Moore somehow made it to your waiver wire, probably want to pick him up. Now let's go over to the Baltimore side of things. And with Baltimore, at least for me, it's very frustrating. This team's very good. This offense is very good. They score a lot of touchdowns. But sadly, Lamar Jackson's not getting any of this. I, I can't tell you how much money I invested into with Lamar Jackson in underdog drafts this offseason. It was a lot. And yeah, I mean, you get two rushing touchdowns in this offense. Neither go to Lamar. If you're looking at the running back usage, I already saw everybody on Twitter trying to clown us for me saying that Keaton Mitchell was someone that you probably shouldn't start this week. And while I understand Keaton Mitchell does get there, ladies and gentlemen, and you can clown on me if you want, he had three carries and one reception. He had four total touches. Okay, so great with those four touches. But in reality, Keaton Mitchell plays 13 snaps. Comparison to Gus Edwards at 28. Justice Hill at 14. So if you're looking at the usage of these running backs, honestly, not super interested in any of these guys going forward. It is just a massive committee. Now, going over to the Saints side of things, we had Derek Carr go down in this game. Jameis Winston steps in. Uh, one of these interceptions, I don't want to put it on Jameis. With Jameis Winston, I really do like the guy. I am rooting for him from a fantasy football perspective. Real life perspective, you can say whatever you want. Don't necessarily think that he's a great player. Fantasy perspective, at least he's pushing the ball downfield. I mean, you did have consistent target volume for Chris Olave. Winston was peppering him. Olave did have nine targets in this game. Alvin Kamara goes out there, has a ton of usage as well. Keep in mind, they were trailing the entire game. So it would be an Alvin Kamara game as well. And then you did have the Michael Thomas injury at the very beginning of the contest. So this next week will be the first week of the season, if Michael Thomas misses, where I think Shahid will be startable. Now, the Vikings in this game, obviously, I think at this point we can say that they're almost America's team. I think we're all rooting for Joshua Dobbs, right? Joshua Dobbs comes out here and force feeds TJ Hawkinson with everybody this morning in our live stream being worried about him being on a snap count. Hawkinson goes out there and has 15 targets, 11 receptions, 134 receiving yards, and the receiving touchdown. Immaculate game from TJ Hawkinson. Looks like Joshua Dobbs' favorite target. Jordan Addison, probably not going to be super viable once we get Justin Jefferson back in. One other note is you do have the concussion for Alexander Madison. So Ty Chandler steps in. Ty Chandler is the starting running back down the stretch for this team. Now, Ty Chandler didn't get involved as a receiver here. Historically speaking, this is a running back that has the possibility of drawing targets out of the backfield. So I do think that he is a viable play if you needed one. If Alexander Madison misses this next week. Now going over to Atlanta. Passing offense just completely collapses. You have 21 passing attempts in comparison to 41 rushing attempts. Bijan Robinson gets there, 22 carries, 95 rushing yards, and the rushing touchdown. Hook of Morns. And then obviously we know at this point nobody's startable here outside of Bijan Robinson. What I will reiterate, and while I am very biased, Hook of Morns, I interviewed him at the draft, ran into him at the gym in Austin. He's my guy. He is the running back that is the number one fantasy football playoff schedule for any running back. He's the number one guy. So that is something to keep in mind, especially as we look at these rookies later on, like Gibbs breaking out. Now going over to Arizona, Kyler Murray looked like he was running the ball. I mean, he only picks up 33 rushing yards, but even in just regular dropbacks, he's going out there scrambling all over the field, throwing the ball away when he needs to. Kyler Murray does look like someone that you can start going forward based off the rushing upside that we saw. James Conner does see the majority of the work in this backfield. Conner is 41 snaps out of 65. Conner, definitely someone that we can start going forward, ladies and gentlemen. And then Trey McBride just absolutely dominates. McBride, 131 receiving yards and eight receptions. We talked about this a few weeks back, but with McBride, this story makes sense. It's a year two tight end. We know typically these guys aren't going to do anything year one. So I don't think this should be coming too much of a surprise. I think this is right in line. And honestly, I'm going to go ahead and keep on starting McBride. 
Now, going over to Detroit, you start everybody. One of the best offenses in the NFL. I wish I would have believed that the Lions were going to be even better than they were advertised to. God knows how many rushing yards you have for Detroit here. You have three rushing touchdowns. You have multiple rushing touchdowns at the goal line for Jameer Gibbs. What's kind of crazy is you would assume that the goal line touchdowns went to David Montgomery, and they definitely gave David Montgomery his opportunities at the goal line. But no, those went to Gibbs. Montgomery's rushing touchdown came from 75 yards out. Amon Ross St. Brown dominates nine targets, but 156 receiving yards and the receiving touchdown at the same time. So yeah, I mean, start everybody in Detroit. You're still starting Sam Laporta. The only thing that maybe is noteworthy here, and we said this last week as well, but I want to reiterate, there's no reason to roster Jamison Williams. If you haven't cut Jamison Williams, it's about that time, or it would have been about that time a few weeks back. Now, the Chargers, on the other hand, I mean, they go out there and you see Keenan Allen, 175 receiving yards, multiple receiving touchdowns. You have no Joshua Palmer. You have no Mike Williams. So everything in this offense is being funneled between Austin Eckler and Keenan Allen, who almost combined this week for 300 total yards. Outside of that, while I understand, yes, Quentin Johnson gets there with the receiving touchdown. Johnson's still not startable. I mean, Justin Herbert had four passing touchdowns this week, right? So, I mean, maybe if Herbert were to average four passing touchdowns per game going forward, then you're excited about Probably not. Going over the Dallas side of things, this wasn't a football game. I don't really want to talk about this too, too much. I'm going to get nine passing attempts for Cooper Rush, right? Everybody crushes. Brandon Cooks dominant by far and away the biggest Brandon Cooks game we've seen all year. I mean, Brandon Cooks up until this point, just every single game was averaging four targets, four targets, four targets, four targets. He gets there. Lamb gets there with 151 receiving yards. Jake Ferguson gets there with the receiving touchdown. Even Michael Gallup gets there with 70 receiving yards and the receiving touchdown. Everybody viable in Dallas. Going over to the Giants side, as expected, nobody viable, even though, you were expecting Barkley to get absolutely everything. It doesn't matter if as a receiver, he gets you a negative five rushing yards. The only way Barkley was going to be viable in this game is if you went out there and he had four receptions for 40 receiving yards. If that would happen, you could have been excited, but obviously here, different story. Now going over to the commanders game, what's very interesting is you look at the leader in receiving yards. You have Brian Robinson. And then after that, you have Antonio Gibson. Followed up with Diamond Brown, then Logan Thomas. Crazy to see this. So you still have over 300 passing yards for Sam Howell. However, McLaurin, Samuel, Dotson, they do nothing. Going forward, what can we really expect here with Brian Robinson? Well, I drafted him in a ton of underdog basketball drafts, and thank God for today. This ain't happening going forward, ladies and gentlemen, okay? He's not leading this team in targets, or he's buying Darren McLaurin. Darren McLaurin at eight. He's not leading this team in receiving. Antonio Gibson still has a role. is still a committee. This is a sell-I moment with Brian Robinson. And then going over to the Seahawks side, we are saying to start pretty much everybody here. Start Metcalf, start Loggins, start Walker. Beautiful matchup. Walker kind of gets lucky. He has the 64-yard receiving touchdown. Thank God. But yeah, outside of that, we're going to reiterate what we said. If you were wanting to sell Kenneth Walker, it was going to be after this Washington game, right? Washington, one of these softest defenses in the NFL to go up against. You have 12 targets for Lockett who gets there with 98 receiving yards. 10 targets for, I'm sorry, that's Metcalf. 10 targets for Lockett with 92 receiving yards and the receiving touchdown. JSN has a whatever day. It's disappointing. I was hoping JSN was going to be better given the matchup. He does have five targets, but really only gets you nine fantasy points. But I think that should be about it for this. Please, if y'all have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them in the comment section. And if there's anything I can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and let me know. I'd be super happy to help you out any way that I can. And yeah, be on the lookout for Leonard Fournette news for tomorrow. Fournette's not playing. I'm not going to mind taking the fewer than 78 and a half total yards on James Cook. If you want to check out that line or any others, promo good flock on underdog, 100% of positive match, plus our rest of season fantasy football rankings and tiers. And on top of that, a Josh Allen special pick of more than less than half a total yard. But thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. I really do appreciate you. Really hope you have a great day and really hope we get to see you out with the live stream on Monday night. It'll be our 200th day live streaming in a row.